for reconvening. We have a, a, a second terrific panel to begin on the question of public scholarship. And I will just start by immediately turning things over to our moderator for this session, uh, Professor Joe Quinn, former Dean of Arts and Sciences and former interim provost and professor of economics and a great friend of uh, the Wells Center. Thank you, Joe. Uh, thank you, Eric. I have the pleasure of introducing briefly our three speakers. Uh, William Dawson is a senior fellow in the Governance Study Program at the Brookings Institution with interest in American politics and domestic policy. policy. His expertise includes contemporary political and social philosophy, the history of political thought, and U.S. domestic policy. He doesn't just write about public policy, he also does it. As we heard, he served as Deputy Assistant for the President for Domestic Policy during the first Clinton administration and was Executive Director of the National Commission on Civic Renewal, which was chaired by Sam Nunn and William Bennett. He's the author of eight books, remember that number, eight, eight and over a hundred articles and taught at the University of Maryland School of Public Policy, where he also served as Acting Dean. My condolences. <laughs> He's a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and the U.S. Marine. I love reading his column in the Wall Street Journal each week, especially during this fascinating presidential race. <laughs> Susan Jacoby is an independent scholar specializing in the history of atheism, secularism, and religious liberty. She's the author of 11 books, or up to 19, including her most recent, recent Strange Gods, A Secular History of Conversion. 2016. Other books include The Age of American Unreason, which sounds particularly timely these days, and Alger Hiss and the Battle for History, and Freethinkers, The History of American Secularism. She writes frequently in the op-ed pages of the New York Times, also in the American Prospect, Descent, The Daily Beast, and elsewhere. She has received many grants and awards from the Nationals Endowment for the Humanities, and from the Guggenheim, Rockefeller, and Ford Foundations. In 2001, she was named a fellow of the Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers at the New York Public Library, and I understand she gets to write in a very special room just for them. She's a member of the board of the Freedom from Religion Foundation and the Center for Inquiry, a secular think tank, and she lives in the Big Apple. Randall Kennedy is a professor of law at the Harvard Law School, where he teaches courses on contracts, criminal law, and the regulation of race relations. He attended Princeton, Oxford, the Yale Law School, and now teaches at Harvard. So I think he's ready for a Supreme Court position. It was noted this morning that all the justices are either Catholics or Jews. It's also well known that they all went to either Harvard or Yale Law School. Although I learned Ruth Bader Ginsburg did get her degree, because she transferred to Columbia, but she didn't go to Harvard. <laughs> Professor Kennedy served as a law clerk on the United States Court of Appeals and on the United States Supreme Court for Justice Thurgood Marshall. Kennedy writes on a wide range of scholarly and general interest publication. He's written eight books, or up to 27, on issues of race, affirmative action, discrimination, crime, and interracial intimacies. His two most recent books are For Discrimination, Race, Affirmative Action, and the Law, 2013, and The Persistence of the Colorblind, Racial Politics, and the Obama Presidency in 2011. He's a member of the American Law Institute, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, the American Philosophical Association, and is also a trustee at Princeton University. Now, those of you who know me are wondering what the heck am I doing here? with authors of more than 27 books to my left, all on fascinating public policy topics. Well, I did some adding up on my own, and I am confident that over my nearly seven years, I have read as many books as these books <laughs> have written. If you count Good Night Moon, Green Ham and Eggs, Prince Rumpheus, and all the books I read to my kids. And that's not bad for an economist. Our topic this session is public scholarship today, and we'll use the same ground rules as Susan Schell described. We're going to ask each of our three guests to speak for five or ten minutes, and then talk among themselves, hopefully so that we can hear you. Um, and then we'll open it up to you, the audience, and a very knowledgeable one it is, as we have already seen today, 
Uh, this is usually my favorite part of any conference, questions from the floor. We will call on our speaker in reverse alphabetical order for a little variety. The first shall be last, and the last first. Now we only have a narrow part of the um, alphabet represented here, from G through K. But I suspect the range of views will be considerably <coughs> wider. So we'll begin with Randall Kennedy, followed by Susan Jacoby, and then William Ross. Thank you. Let the games begin. Thank you very much. Can I be heard throughout the room? Great. First, I'm, I'm delighted to, um, to be here and participate in this um, recognition. I'm going to focus my remarks on uh, how, on actually, my aspirations as a as a scholar, as a commentator, as a as an intellectual, as a public intellectual. Um, there, there are three things in particular that I aspire to do in my work that um, Alan Wolf has demonstrated. And uh, these are three things that it seems to me are um, hallmarks of distinguished uh, public intellectuals. One, start with the first quality, versatility. So intellectuals do a variety of things. They try to communicate in a variety of ways, in a variety of formats. And some people are better at this than others. There's some people who, you know, they, they, they're, they're very good at writing uh, specialized books that are wonderfully enlightening to their, to the small group of people who are specialists who understand what they're trying to say. And that's their aspiration. They just want to write to that small group. And, and, and that's fine. Um, I actually prefer and um, find more attractive the folks who have a wide array of um, sort of weapons at their command, um, have a wider, a, a, a wider path, the person who can write books, write books that interest specialists, but also write books that are open, that are accessible to a general audience. There are people who can write to specialists, there are people who can write to the general audience, there are people who can write the essay, there are people who can write the opinion editorial piece. In other words, as far as I'm concerned, one hallmark of the, of the, of, of the best of the, of the public intellectuals are people who have a real intellectual versatility. And this is a skill that's like any other skill. It can be worked on. You can, you can work on your versatility. You can work on becoming more open, um, making your work, making your knowledge more accessible to a wider array of people. Um, a second uh, important quality, it seems to me, is quality in which you, uh, pe people who are, well, in academic terms, interdisciplinary folks, people who don't just stay in one part of the library, let's say the part of the library that's marked political science. Now they venture out, they're, they're not afraid to go into the you know, place where the sociologists hang out. They're not even afraid to go into the place where places where maybe the the novels hang out. They're people who are willing and ready and able and daring enough to go to any source <coughs> that can help them illuminate their subject. And that's something that we've certainly seen with Alan Wolf's work. He was introduced this morning sociologist, but of course that's only part of 
is bad. <coughs> You go anywhere, anywhere where there is information uh, that will help him illuminate his subject. And it seems to me that, again, the most distinguished of the you know, of, of intellectuals are people who are willing to go anywhere uh, to get the information they need, to get the, um, the various devices that they need. They're willing to study anything that will enable them to present more persuasively the points, the arguments they wish to make. Third is independence. So when I'm you know, sort of looking around, looking at books, looking at articles, looking at essays, you know, who are the people that uh, I most respect? Who are the people who uh, I find, as intellectuals, actually, to be the most thrilling. They're the people who are most independent. The people who, when you listen to them, when you listen to them, you're listening to their voice. Now, we're all situated. We all have our preferences. We all have our ideological or religious or disciplinary preferences, inclinations, proclivities. We're all situated. But the people that I find that I must admire are the people who are independent and who actually are, are willing to break from their tribe, whether it be their racial tribe, whether it be their ethnic tribe, whether it be their religious tribe, whether it be their disciplinary tribe. So in my view, these three qualities, versatility, a knack for interdisciplinary adventure, uh, independence, those are three qualities in intellectual life. That, uh, that I admire and that in you know, the pursuit, pursuit of my own work, um, I try to um, actualize. Thank you. Uh, Alan and I actually met under circumstances which I think cast a special light on the kind of person and intellectual he is. Uh, in 2004, he wrote a negative review of my book, Free Thinkers, The History of American Secularism, for the New Republic. A few years later, we were invited to be on a panel on something or other. I don't remember what it was about. And then Alan did something that's unprecedented in my experience as an aggrieved writer. He said that if he were reviewing my book today, meaning the date of our panel around 2006, in view of various things that had happened in the second Bush administration to blur the lines between church and state, he would have modified his views and taken my arguments against all public financing for faith-based projects more seriously. Now, my experience has been that, especially in matters of religion, almost no one, including atheists as well as religious believers, academics and non-academics, ever reconsiders their position, and instead, what an odious term this is, and we're hearing it all the time now, simply doubles down on the original position. And I've never encountered anyone else willing to say that he or she would consider anything written in a review. Uh, that applies to me. This encounter with Alan years ago, in fact, made me take a closer look in the mirror. And I think it's exactly that's what a good public intellectual is supposed to do to people. Uh, because we've been instructed to make our opening remarks brief, I'm going to concentrate on one area of interest that Alan and I and many of the people in this room share, the role of religion in public life. Uh, there's no question that controversy over the role of religion in public life and in the conduct, con conduct of government has sharpened and grown more bitter since I wrote Freethinkers. 
Now, note that I make a distinction between public life, a squishy term which sounds in my ears pretty much like spirituality, and the conduct of government. Public life, as I define it, is pretty much anything that takes place outside your own home. This conference is a part of public life and discourse, but government is something else. When we talk, for example, about taxpayer support for faith-based drug rehab programs that proselytize as a result of their recovery efforts, we're talking about government, not some amorphous thing that we call public life. As I've been traveling throughout the country during the past two months promoting my new book, one question I'm asked frequently is why religion has not been a big issue in the presidential primaries. Now this question absolutely astonishes me. And I think perhaps the reason is that religion is now so thoroughly intertwined with politics that people don't recognize religion even when they see it. On the Republican side, the comments that have been made about excluding Muslim immigrants and, quote, monitoring, unquote, Muslim neighborhoods um, show that we have national figures, yes, graduates of Harvard, graduates of the Wharton School of Business, who haven't absorbed the basic guarantees of our Constitution. They used to be taught in high school civics classes. We have all of the candidates talking, another example, as well they should, about the persecution of Christians by ISIS. But we haven't heard one word from any of the candidates about the persecution of free thinkers and atheists who have the temerity to blog about women's rights and freedom of conscience. Uh, this persecution conducted not only by terrorists, but by some of our good theocratic buddies like Saudi Arabia. I was terribly disappointed when John Kerry called out ISIS for its genocidal policies against Christians, but didn't say one word about anyone else who disagrees with theocracy, uh, including Muslims who disagree with ISIS, and free thinkers as well as Christians. We are, I think, and this is an important subject for public intellectual, as an Alan has written about it in many different ways. We're living in a political environment in which freedom of conscience is talked about as a right for the religious rather than for the non-religious as well. Uh, this is a very, a very disturbing uh, trend. Um, I think, now I see that I've forgotten my page, but that's just as good. I think that one of the vital purposes of the public intellectual is not only independence, as Randall Kennedy just said, but an absolute willingness to look at things that are not only outside, perhaps, of his or her subject, but even may go counter to it. Uh, I think that, that one of the vital things for a public intellectual to do is look not only at groups, but as individuals. It would be wonderful, and again, I think one of the essential functions of a public intellectual is to point this out, not just in groups like this, but I'd like to hear more about it right now in the campaign. The importance when John Kerry talks about genocide as something committed against Christians, when Hillary Clinton and Bernie Sanders and Donald Trump and Ted Cruz and the late Mario Rubio, to speak metaphorically, when they talk only about the persecution of Christians by terrorists, to point out to them that a whole other group of being, is being persecuted. And this would lead to what I think is the greatest credo of all. Thomas Paine's My Own Mind is My Own Church. And if I were to pick one public intellectual whom all of us, academic or non-academic, should model us after, it's Thomas Paine. Thank you. Well, um, my remarks are going to track in, in structure and not quite in content, um, Professor Kennedy. Uh, but let me begin by pulling <clears throat> a Washington trick 
In the interest of time, I will simply associate myself with the remarks of all of my colleagues <laughs> on this panel and the previous one when it comes to the virtues of Alan Lewis. I'll, I'll, I'll expand on that. Uh, and this being Boston College, uh, I thought I'd start with a Tony quote from Aristotle's Metaphysics. Uh, and it goes like this. All men by nature desire to know. An indication of this is the delight we take in our senses, for even apart from their usefulness, they are loved for themselves. And Aristotle goes on to single out sight as the most revealing of the senses. We have an interesting discussion about that. Uh, and it happens to be the sense uh, from which our word theory is derived. <coughs> what it's pointing to there is the delight in seeking, or as you might say, contemplating that which is for its own sake. And when you're thinking about the world of scholarship, this perennial human impulse to seek and contemplate that which is for its own sake can never be overlooked uh, and must never be minimized. Within my own religious tradition, Judaism, there's the concept of Torah Lishma, the study of God's word for its own sake, without regard to its further consequences. On the other hand, there's a contrast within Judaism between that way of studying Torah and the mode of studying Torah, which is designed to produce actions in the world. And there is an extensive rabbinical tradition on the importance of wisdom for action, and indeed, the relative unimportance of wisdom that does not lead to action. If I had a lot of time, I'd quote all sorts of fascinating rabbinical, uh, you know, rabbinical sayings to that effect and discussions. Uh, and the exemplars within the Jewish tradition tend to be people who use their wisdom to guide to lead, to benefit the community. And the greatest Jewish scholar of all time, Moses Maimonides, was also a faithful guide you know, to his own community, but to Jewish communities around the world. And the record holds literally hundreds of responses that he gave to perplexed communities or members of the Jewish communities around the world who were seeking guidance as to what to do Difficult, difficult issues and questions. Now, why this big wind-up answer? I think that the vocation of public scholarship, the official theme of, of this panel, is squarely into that second category of knowledge that may be prized for its own sake in part, but was but which is oriented towards some sort of action in the world. So the first distinguishing characteristic of the public scholar is the selection of questions. As we all know in academia, there are certain sorts of questions that emerge within each discipline and which are regarded as important within that discipline, but which may not have any particular bearing on the world. And a lot of academic scholars is focused on those questions, honorably so, uh, because that is, you know, in my phrase, Torah Lishma, the search of, you know, the quest for knowledge for its own sake within that discipline. Public scholars pick questions based on what are or ought to be matters of public attention and concern. If they are already on the public agenda, the public scholar will seek to eliminate if they're not on the agenda, but ought to be, the public scholar will seek to put them there. Uh, and you can't do that, and here I simply uh, uh, echo Professor Kennedy, unless you are prepared to employ as one of the tools in your repertoire modes of discourse that are appropriate for a public setting and 
and not simply for a specialist or a scholarly setting. Public scholarship, however, is not distinguished from academic scholarship necessarily by its methods. One can be as rigorous as possible, you know, as an economist, a demographer, a political scientist, what have you, but the point is to bring that rigor <coughs> on publicly, to bear on publicly important issues. Let me give you an example of how, of how this functions. We've known generally for a long time that there is a link between your educational and, and occupational and income status on the one hand and longevity on the other. But recent high quality scholarly work by you know, a team that included a recent winner of the Nobel Prize in Economics has documented in very considerable detail what that means for different groups in the population. How certain groups, you know, members of the white, rural, uh, white working class in rural and small town areas, are actually, in, are actually experiencing declining life expectancy. Stunning findings. Now, and, it, and these are findings that have been presented in accessible public forum as well as in highly academic uh, publications from the National Academy of Sciences. What does this mean? Well, many of us have been talking about social security reform, for example, for the better part, the better part of 20 years. For a long time, one, po one popular idea was raising the retirement age. Okay? Well, if it turns out that raising the retirement age, knowing what we now know about differential demography means that the people who already are least advantaged lose what little they have. Well, from a number of moral perspectives and faith perspectives, that's simply no longer worthy of consideration. So on this most important question, Namely, how are we going to provide decent retirements for an increasing fraction of the American population that is, you know, that, that is aging uh, over age 65 or 70, whatever, whatever the mark is? A piece of work that began with the statistical analysis by the National Academy of Sciences turns out to be the lever you know, for a new understanding of this of this public question. To close the loop and in conclusion, what this tells me is that public scholarship, uh, even, when it's, even when it's empirical, or perhaps especially when it's empirical, can function as the minor premise of practical syllogism, the major premise of which is supplied by a moral proposition of the form that it is wrong to disadvantage the least Thank you. Would either of you like to comment on what the others of you said? Yes, I, and I think this is this is one of the most important questions for all of us to consider. What you say is absolutely true, and yet we're living in a political climate in which there has never been more resistance from a great many members of the political class to considering this research seriously as a lever to move public policy. For example, there has been endless talk in the campaign about raising the retirement age as, in other words, as if none of the research you just mentioned existed, as if none of it had been published. It's in a way analogous to climate change in the, in the physical sciences. Uh, the idea that just because this research exists and it's quite rigorous scientifically and has produced a, a, another thing of great importance, which is life expectancy for poor women has decreased even more. Quite possibly uh, all of the facts are in simply because women smoke more than ever before and smoking being a factor already associated with it. But, the question is, how do you get people to listen in 
an anti-intellectual climate, and it is a climate of anti-intellectualism being fostered. Uh, I wrote a book called The Age of American Unreason in 2008. If I were to write it today, I would have to make it much worse because the questioning of other things, uh, new, new research about the, about the same day as the latest findings about life expectancy and income inequality came out, uh, came out a new study about how much early unplanned pregnancy, whether women are married or unmarried, affects their future earning pro prospects and education. I think well, there are more and more, there's more and more research asking these questions about what ought to be on the public agenda. There is also more and more resistance to taking it seriously just because it comes from intellectuals and experts, which is always used as a pejorative. Always. You used to, you used to hear experts cited as, as people who ought to be listened to. Now it's almost always cited sarcastically. Well, I, you know, I thought a great deal about the question that you just raised, and that is the distance, perhaps even the growing distance between scholarship on the one hand and political discourse, deliberation, and decision decision on the other. And I think it it has been a very complex set of developments that have taken us in the past half century from a period in which expertise re received deference, perhaps excessive deference, to a period in which just the reverse is, is the case. And uh, I would parse I would parse it this way. Uh, there has been a dramatic increase in partisan polarization during this period. I've spent a lot of my time in the past decade at Brookings charting the dramatic increase in partisan polarization. And in my analysis, a lot of that has been driven by, and in turn has exacerbated, the breakdown of common frames of reference. Uh, even within people who claim to, who say they are liberal or conservative economists. In 1971, Richard Nixon famously said, we're all Keynesian now. <laughs> and seven years later, that was no longer true. It hasn't been true ever since. And if one, if, if one set of economists says that when you raise taxes, revenues go down, and another set says that when you raise them, they go up, you know, uh, it becomes more difficult to function. Uh, so polarization has, has something to do with it. The other piece of it, the other piece of it has to do with uh, another piece of it has to do with populist suspicion. Right? I think uh, I happen to believe that the period during which expertise received deference in American society after the Second World War was an aberrant period of American history. You know, and our default setting is more populist than but you know, but I can I can argue that point. But I provoked you. Yeah, I, I mean, obviously, or straight up, I'm I'm against anti-intellectualism in American life. I'm also, however, a bit skeptical whenever I hear uh, a narrative that suggests that things were better. I, didn't, I said different. I want to, so even with the question of expertise, my, my sense is that, you know, there has always been a large, latent skepticism about the pointy heads, the experts, I mean, I, you know, I mean, in, in the past, I don't know this, but I would, I would wonder if one were, for instance, to ask or to study um, in the past, let's say, 30 years, one were to study examples in which, episodes in which knowledge, scientific knowledge, 
was mobilized in a particular way to try to advance a social policy. So for instance, I think of the campaign against smoking, or I think of the question of global warming. Now on the one hand, we see denialism, we see the skepticism of the experts, we see even, even more insidiously, the use of experts to throw sand in the eyes of people, the use of experts against expertise. We see all of that. But you know, we also do see, over time, the use of knowledge being used in a progressive way. It's always a game. I mean, intellectuals are always, academics, intellectuals, scholars, we're always going to be up against it. We're always going to be up against the forces of inertia. We're always going to be up against the forces of, of, of ignorance, superstition. We're always going to be up against the, 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 the problem of, of envy. It's one of the reasons why, for instance, at least in my view, from time to time, we have intellectuals who sort of throw, you know, say, gosh, don't we have to be worried about uh, uh, the problem of the problem of knowledge. So uh, Professor Shattuck, I think, at, at, at Boston University wrote this book, in many ways a very fine book, Forbidden Knowledge. And it was the sort of the fear of mankind's ability for the generation of knowledge outrunning uh, mankind's ability to be prudent in the use of that knowledge. My own view was, don't worry about it. Intellectuals, go for it, because there's enough out there that's going to hold us back. We don't have to be worried about that. Well, that's there, there's, some, there's, some, there's something else, too. Uh, in the 1950s, uh, if, if one, uh, I, I, I agree with you, by the way, uh, there was no golden age. But to the extent that there was about intellectualism, that was positive then. It focused on science, and there was really a reason for it, and anybody who is my age, just 70, uh, will remember it. People saw from science results that affected their everyday lives, and more important, people of all economic classes saw it. I remember when the salt polio vaccine came into use. Before then, <laughs> We weren't allowed to go to public parks and swim. Parents of that generation, my parents' generation, the World War II generation, were all terrified for their children. And it went all across the economic spectrum. There wasn't anything that about being rich that could stop you from getting polio. The salt vaccine came in. Everybody knew about it. Children all over, it was given free. They stood in long lines. Within two years, cases of polio in the United States had dropped to almost nothing. Now that is the kind of achievement connected to science. What might have, what might, what some people might have said 30 years earlier would have been pure research that has nothing to do with me. The kind of things that people can see. Whereas something like climate change and some of the things that intellectuals not talking now about scientists, but I'm, I'm using it as a broad term, including hard scientists as well as what I call soft scientists. Uh, they could see it, and there was something else. So one, advances that people could see that made their lives immediately better, that they didn't have to wait for, and we didn't have to think about our grandchildren. It, it was us. And second, as, as I'm the only person here who's made my living without a professorship but an attachment to an institution. Uh, uh, the media are worse in one respect. They have less respect for expertise, which doesn't at all imply that I disagree with you. On the media today, you did not see things on what TV there was back in 1954, saying on the one hand, it might be a good thing to cure polio, and on the other hand, it might be too big a risk. You didn't see anything like you do that is so 
fostered the rise of the anti-vaccination movement here. As on television, always when they have a scientist say, no, vaccines don't cause autism. Then you have another movie star who thinks that her child got autism because you know she had the, the, the measles and mumps vaccine. These things are too often in almost every area, intellectual area, given equal weight. Always the idea that the truth is somewhere exactly halfway between two points, and that there aren't, uh, as intellectuals, people have to be afraid, not just as intellectuals, as people who are working on research projects about infrastructure, let's say. Uh, you have to be prepared to say that one, there are occasions when one thing is right and one thing is wrong. I mean, when, for example, I remember when, when the Henry Louis Gates incident happened and President Obama said the police were stupid uh, and the furor that was resulted. And I remember watching on my local news in New York, there would always be one person being interviewed uh, from the police department, you know, saying the president shouldn't have said the police were stupid. And another person say he would never have done that if he'd been a white man, you know, fumbling for his keys uh, or answering his door in a white neighborhood. <laughs> now, the fact is, the president may have been prudent to use the word stupid, but he wasn't wrong, and yet all of the coverage was as if the truth were half right in the middle. I think that really affects the work of public intellectuals, attitudes toward intellectualism and knowledge in general. Thank you. Let me take, let me take up that point. Uh, I don't think, I don't think you have to be committed to a golden age theory of the relationship between the life of the mind and you know, the public world and the world of public policy and the government to believe that there are eras you know, that are marked by different stances towards these questions. Uh, and I may be speaking, I'll speak on a biographically for just a minute, as the son of a scientist. Okay? And I saw, uh, I saw up close in the period from the Second World War through most of the 1960s, the kinds of deference that science received in public, in public discourse. Uh, I think there are historical reasons for that, including the fact that scientists were seen as instrumental in winning the Second World War. And so setting aside the medical benefits, the military benefits of the application of research you know, to a very, very public act, namely waging, waging, winning a war, uh, those were so undeniable and so central to the lived realities of the mass of Americans uh, that there was a, a default of deference, a rebuttable presumption in favor of deference. But where I want to take up you know, something that Professor Kennedy said is the sort of the letter rip theory of the acquisition of knowledge. Okay, and here once again, you know, speaking, you know, speaking as the son of this same, same scientist, I don't even have to refer to the qualms that the atomic scientists from different countries expressed about the research they had done that led to the consequences that they did before. When my father was a beginning assistant professor at Caltech, he did a piece, he did a piece of, of research, pioneer research on plant growth hormones, you know, hormones both in, you know, that appeared in plants, but also that could be administered to plants that accelerated their growth. And at the end of this article, he dropped a little footnote. He said, I made a very curious discovery. These same substances that accelerate, that accelerate growth at certain doses of concentrations retarded at higher concentrations, and if you get really high, their leaves fall. Well, two years later, he was visited by a small delegation from Fort Dietrich, Maryland. Mm -hmm. oh. Okay? You know, the, the center then, to some extent now, of chemical and biological research. 
Uh, and you know, he thought it was his responsibility as a scientist to answer their questions, which he did. Thirteen years later, he realized to his horror that this discovery of his advanced eventual creation of Asian okay, art, which then mobilized him into an entirely different career, not as a private scientist, but as a public scholar, and increasingly as a public, as a public intellectual. Now, the lesson that I draw from that episode is that we are, I think, required and neglected our peril the requirement to think about the potential uses of the knowledge that we're generating. Uh, and does that mean we suppress it? Does it mean that we don't go down certain roads of inquiry at all? Well, maybe and maybe not. Uh, but it is a question. And to the, ex to the extent that we are public, or to the extent that what we hope is private can become public, I don't see how we can avoid that question. And I suspect you agree with that. I would agree with that. I mean, obviously this is a deep, you know, there's, there's a reason why Frankenstein uh, has, you know, gripped the imaginations of people. I mean, there's a reason, of, of course, there's a very deep thing. Um, I guess, though, once, I guess, I'm for, let's think about everything. <laughs> let's think about everything, including, of course, Let's think about the bad uses to which this knowledge can be put. And we have to be aware of that in order to you know, and hopefully avoid bad uses. So the, 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 that too is knowledge. I'm, I'm, simply, I'm, I'm, I'm simply embracing the idea of knowledge and saying that in our world, um, you know, it, it's one of one of the horrifying aspects of our world is the degree to which knowledge and the institutions that shelter knowledge are under such threat. It's one of the reasons why, you know, in this past year, you know, well, every year there's 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 always something going on at universities. And there's always protests. There's always things that going on. But I must say that for, for myself, more and more and more, I find myself saying to you know the, the most dissident students with whom I come in contact, listen, I'm not saying that this institution or any of these institutions are you know no, they're not heaven, they're not paradise, they've got problems, but any institution that has as its you know, as its, as its mission, the production and the dissemination of knowledge, that is a precious institution. And, you know, when people start talking about, you know, shut it down, I, I used to not, you know, sort of, I used to just sort of chuckle to myself and, and not pay attention. Well, not anymore. I hear that and I immediately jump up and say, no, 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 no. And all around, there are people who would want to shut places like this down. And by the way, I don't just mean the universities. I don't just mean the universities. Think tanks, the independent intellectuals, the, the libraries, the whole infrastructure of knowledge is precious. And we as people, in our various ways, who love as far as I'm concerned, we need to be more militant in the defense of it. May I just ask one uh, question and end with sort of a personal query, and then I'd love to open it up to you folks. Um, and that is, um, how do you view your role in this era that we've been talking about, the divisiveness and hostility to the ideas of others? I mean, Susan told me a story of being booed at a recent talk in California when she suggested that the word science that somebody was misusing might be reserved for the natural sciences, the salt vaccine, and not some anthropological speculation that was going on, but she was booed. Um, so my question there are public intellectuals respected in America today. Are people listening to our public intellectuals or basically just reading 
things that they already all, all, already agree on. Do you feel that you make a difference? Can you? <laughs> okay, that's really the question. Can your writing change somebody's views on um, vaccines and autism or genetically modified organizations? Which, uh, organisms, which everyone seems to be an expert on. By the way, a word invented by a member of our English department for genetically modified foods is Frankenfood, which I was reminded of when you said Frankenfood. <coughs> anyway, are you frustrated in your role? Are people listening to you? Do you make a difference? Who wants to start? Uh, I don't I don't know. Know. All right, I'll, I'll go first because I think, in fact, uh, intellectuals who aren't affiliated with institutions uh, are becoming rarer, partly because of the constriction of print media, which uh, I used to finance my books by writing articles for magazines, of which there were a lot, which paid me $5,000 for a 4,000 word article, which would be absolutely, I, mean, I just thought of it in terms of I'm buying time, as I'm sure sometimes professors at universities, sometimes at various phases of your careers, think that you're buying time for whatever you're more interested in. But I think that this, this is true whether, whether an intellectual is freelance, as it were, or, uh, or uh, affiliated with an academic institution and spent years getting a PhD in a particular <coughs> subject. Uh, the, the role of the public intellectual can't be to think that anything they're writing or working on at a given time is going to change someone's mind, uh, or, it's, or that it's going to change many people's minds, or the majority of people's minds. This sounds idealistic, but the older you get, the more you have to think this way, as you see some of the things you wrote very hopefully when you were in your 20s, uh, that the same issues are being relitigated today. Uh, that you're contributing to a base of knowledge, which, as you mentioned, may move things forward in time. That somebody may look at it 30 or 50 or 100 years from now differently than they do today. And so I think, no, probably nothing I do. And I don't write about American secular history because I think it's going to save it's going to change Ted Cruz's mind or anyone who thinks like that. But I do think that over time, it, what it can do is inject another note into the discussion. And this, this incident that Joe referred to uh, in California, and I, I really didn't realize it. It was the only time I had ever been booed by an audience. And I, could, I couldn't even explain myself because the booing was so loud. What someone else on the panel had said, which again, had a lot to do with the role of, of faith in public life, was that neurological science had determined beyond a, beyond a doubt that the desire to believe was, and the word neurological was used again, was inherent in human beings from prehistory. Well, I just asked him, I said, uh, I said, what neurologists are you talking about? Anyway, anyway, as, as it turned out, his answer he wasn't talking about neurologists. What he was talking about was cultural anthropologists, uh, mainly. And I said, well, I don't know what cultural anthropology has to teach. It brings forth the materials on which we can study prehistory. But in fact, what, what anthropologists thought 100 years ago, based on their observation of what they were bringing forth, for, has been proven quite wrong by modern DNA testing. Uh, look, one of, the, one of the tenets, for example, of anthropology, uh, speaking of changing people's minds, for about 130 years, was this that Neanderthal man and Homo sapiens never really had anything to do with each other. The Homo sapiens came along later, and that the two species uh, couldn't, uh, couldn't uh, copulate. 
and recent, again, uh, it's a recent DNA testing has proved fascinatingly that Neanderthal man did fool around with the early members of our species. So, so in fact, some of those people at the time of the Scopes trial who accused scientists of, of, of saying we were the same as monkeys were in a very large sense right. But, but I do think that, uh, that, that, that even, even people who have actually taken time out to work for the government, I doubt, uh, and, and, and people who have also, uh, which in law is more common in the humanities, that it's easier because uh, people in law school generally also know how to do lawyerish things some in the practical world as you do. So it's easier to, com to combine those things. But, but I do think that, that the, uh, the idea that what intellectuals do is change minds right away, could have a very unhappy life if, if you think it's going to change mostly right now, unless you're working on a case that gets decided by a different Supreme Court. Than we have. So would you gentlemen agree with that? Well, um, very quickly, and the rest of our questions. Um, you know, I would, you know, you know, my most constant public act, you know, is writing pieces of the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and it's not exactly preaching to the choir in my case. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I get hundreds of comments every week, and I can tell you that not a single one of those comments reflects a successful act of persuasion. <laughs> uh, so I would say that my public activity is, you know, is analogous to what Samuel Johnson famously said about second marriages, the triumph of hope and experience. On the other hand, every faith tradition tells us that despair is a sin. Um, my answer to you is uh, unequivocal. Yes, I think that I think that intellectuals ought not let their pride trip them up. And the fact of the matter is, you write something. One of the great things about writing things is they go out, and actually, you don't know. You don't know what kid is going to read something. You might write something now. It goes off in some, you know, it's in some magazine. Ten years from now, some kid reads something. For me, um, when I was in college, I think of, you know, so who, who, who were people that meant a lot to me who, you know, they wrote things that I, I bet they wouldn't have thought would have, would have any, you know, affected me at all. Irving Howe, Dwight McDonald. The last paper that I wrote in college was about Dwight McDonald's politics magazine. Little magazine. People, when it, was, when it came out, you know, three people read Dwight McDonald's politics magazine. Made a big difference for me. So I think that people who, you know, are, are writing things, people who are giving lectures, people who participate in seminars. I think you do your best. Um, and you really don't know. But there are enough instances, there are enough instances where you know, all sorts of people, you know, what made you want to do this? What inspired you to do this? They make reference to some teacher or some preacher or something that happened that really charted a new way in their life and you know then they did something that charted a new way for somebody else. So you know don't you know don't expect you know don't expect huge crowds and huge applause but that doesn't mean that what you're doing you know doesn't matter. I think it does matter. Good optimistic response. The floor is open. There's a bunch in the corner there. Hi, uh, my name is uh, John Summers. I edit a magazine called The Baffler, and I want to make a uh, 
personal uh, occasion of thanks to Alan Wolf, who, um, when I came to him after having utterly failed as an academic professional uh, five or six years ago, was the only person in the area to open his doors to me as a visiting scholar at the Wazi Center, also should be part of this discussion, and provided a bridge in my professional life between the academic institutions which we're speaking here and the world of what we think of as intellectual journalism, cultural uh, cultural journalism is a different version of public scholarship. Uh, so thank you, Alan, for your kindness and that important moment. Um, I also want to address a question to the panel. There's a couple of things that haven't been mentioned. Uh, it's been a little bit of a hermetic discussion from our perspective. The role of technology in disseminating ideas is changing as we're sitting here. Um, the structure of the academic institutions, which um, Professor Kennedy has defended, has changed very dramatically um, in the last couple of generations. Is arguably have become an engine of social inequality um, and, uh, and so forth, um, as well as um, uh, effectuating a kind of purge from our perspective certain types of publicly oriented young scholars who can't afford to compete in job markets which don't really function. And the third question, and any of these in order or whatever it is, it, it, um, is you've talked about the word intellectual exclusively in terms of liberal or leftist, secular, moral, um, uh, morals based liberalism. Uh, and you know, Paul Ryan and Newt Gingrich also consider themselves intellectuals. And so I wonder if it's possible to be a conservative intellectual. Uh, I'll stop. <coughs> Response? Uh, the structure of academic institutions. I, one thing for me that's very valuable is I get asked to speak at a lot of colleges. Most of them, oddly, are historically religious colleges because they're more interested in secular atheist traditions than secular universities are. But sometimes it's, it's something entirely different. Last year I spoke at Youngstown State University, which is a commuter institution, part of the Ohio State University system but is attended mainly by the children of immigrants. In other words, they're first-generation immigrants, or first-generation immigrants, African-American students, and poor white students whose families have been left behind by the collapse of the steel industry. All the people Don Donald Trump is promising to help us. And so I, I wish Bernie Sanders had been around when I was talking because he raised the free tuition issue. And these kids were working two or three jobs, all of them, to put themselves through a school for which I was astonished to learn that tuition was $4,000 a year because this university is no ticket to a great job. And I had to explain a few references because this talk was about religion and secularism, and I modified it a lot. One. I was amazed, although in some ways they knew a lot less than the kinds of kids who attend Boston College or Augustana College or Fairfield University. They haven't had as good high school educations. And yet they were like sponges. They were sitting there taking notes or, 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 or typing it into their, uh, you know, into, the, into their iPad. An extraordinary number of them emailed me on my author website afterwards. I, I, I think that, by the way, is one thing, although it's hard, particularly with reaching the young in terms of what you said, hopefully, that you can do. And I got these letters of, I, of thanks for having you know, told them how to reach me by email. And one of the questions uh, I had asked several students privately was, how they, you know, how much they thought about their student loans. And they said constantly. Uh, but I remember this one, one girl who spoke beautiful English, but with a kind of very heavy Croatian accent. Uh, and, and she said, I, I know that I'm going to have to go on and find something else to do 
and move away from Youngstown. And I know that this degree that I'm going to owe about $12,000 at the end for is not going to give me a job. But she said, the other thing I know is without it, I never have any chance of getting a job. And she wrote me, this girl with three jobs, about two weeks later and asked me for a reading list of books by atheists and skeptics beginning in the ancient world. Now, I mean, that meant more to me than if I had, if you didn't get letters about changing people's minds, that in some ways maybe the function is to change people's minds, but perhaps to expose people. I was, when you mentioned that, I, that's how I felt that, you know, maybe I've made some kind of a tiny difference in her life. She'll read more. And under circumstances, in which it's difficult. One of, the, one of the things that infuriates me is to hear the political candidates talking about education as though nobody poor is interested in learning anything at all for its own sake. They're only interested if it'll get them somewhere. Other questions? <laughs> I just would like to okay, there. Okay, one, one question. We just heard two examples, to go back to the earlier thing about the question was, you know, do you, your question was, you know, do you do you feel that you make a difference? We just hear two examples. So, Alan Wolf providing at a very important point assistance that then leads to the continuation of a wonderful publication, Baffler, which itself affects people's lives. That's an example. This example with the young woman who writes and says. Could you give me, you know, she, she obviously was turned on to some extent. She's writing him asking you for, you know, additional information. You know, perfect examples, it seems to me, of why people ought not sort of get down in the mouth because they're, you know, maybe because they're not getting a huge audience. The question of circulation. You know, so some publication might have a huge circulation. <laughs> Frankly, nobody's really reading it. They're just reading the, you know, the, the, the ads, and that's what I do. Uh, versus a place of a publication that might have a very small circulation, but it's a very potent circulation because people actually read the thing, and it affects people's lives. So, again, on the question of you know intellectuals feeling diminished, feeling down, feeling what they you know do doesn't matter, they ought not to do it. Right there, uh, Chris Winship, Sociology yes, at please Harvard. Please introduce yourself. You're doing a good job with this. <laughs> and we'll look for So Chris Winship, uh, Sociology at Harvard. Uh, so we heard a lot of talk about the intellectualism of America. Certainly something that concerns me. Um, I wanted to broaden the conversation to the question of, you know, to what degree are public intellectuals, academics, doing a reasonable job of policing themselves. So we, we know we have a huge crisis in medical research in terms of reliability. We have a big debate going on in terms of whether psychological research is, uh, can be replicated, it's reliable, valid. Um, Jim Coleman many decades ago said, you know, in, uh, all we have to do is have you know, a market of ideas and the best ideas will win. Um, I think he might have been influenced too much by economics. Uh, I think we might well say that uh, you know there's some real failure there. Susan has done a nice job of pointing out how the media sort of is failing in its role. And it seems to me that particularly if we're talking about public and intellectuals, you know, how do we you know have the right appropriate contest between ideas and that, so that you know the good ideas win in some sense. We could put that word in quotes. Uh, as opposed to, you know, on the one hand it's this, and on the, one, on the other hand it's, it's that. And to me, at least, this seems like it's as much of a crisis as the intellectualism of the American public. Thank you. Let me, since I didn't respond on the previous question, let me, let me take a crack at this one. First of all, I think you're uh, I think you're absolutely right, you know, particularly uh, in this era of 
intense suspicion of everything and everybody, and certainly everything that stands up and claims to be <coughs> authoritative. <coughs> rigorous self-policing is a necessary but not sufficient condition of the credibility of the public representation of, of knowledge. And this is an issue not only when methods are shoddy, but also when uh, the material support for research <coughs> gives rise to the suspicion uh, that, uh, that the results were pre-cooked in some way. I think this is especially a problem in the medical profession now. I actually been very surprised to learn about the publishing habits of the most esteemed medical journals in the country when faced with submission researchers who were backed by by entities with interests in a certain kind of out outcome, outcome of the research. So yes, yes, absolutely. But on the flip side, uh, we are we are living in an age in which the traditional gatekeepers have all vanished, and there you know for good and for ill. There used to be barriers between private thoughts and public representations. Now there are none. And so the marketplace is much more crowded than it used to be. And rather than the marketplace of ideas, I'm afraid we're seeing something like Gresham's Law. Uh, and, uh, you know, and, and so in one way or another, since nobody can be an expert or a judge in more than a handful, handful of, of areas. There needs to be some mechanism whereby those who are competent to make these judgments on behalf of others actually do it. Uh, and I say this with no confidence that it's going to happen. I think the genie's out of the bottle to go back to the pre previous <coughs> question. I'm less of a fan of the new technology and dissemination of ideas than I suspect people 20, 30, 40, 50 years younger than I am are, because I do think that the disappearance of enormous cost to our culture. Uh, but, uh, but here we are, and I don't see any way of turning back the clock, which means, to conclude this oration, that in the absence of, in the absence of gatekeepers, uh, it, you know, gatekeepers at the level of the movement from the, public, from the private thought to the public realm, journals and, that have a special claim to expertise ought to be our first one against bad and shocking research. <coughs> I think there's no need for each person to respond to each question, but would either of you like to, or should we grab another one? You'd have been booed at the very mention of gatekeepers by the <laughs> audience. <laughs> <laughs> I, I get booed every week. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. You really do. Yes. Yes. versatility 
and interdisciplinary and independence virtues, if you will, um, that give us a good movement into public scholarship. My question is this, uh, in looking at the larger things that we keep dealing with, could those of you on the podium reflect briefly on fears that are at the center of square, uh, uh, fears that you're squared off with at the center of your own long journey in doing scholarship? Fears that I think that somehow we don't get to the truth if we're afraid, and so in that, I'm interested to try and collect as much as possible that Well, I mean, for me, a thing I've bumped up against in, in, in this season as well, um, in an atmosphere in which there is sharp conflict and let's suppose that you're on one side the folks that are on your side especially if you are in a privileged position I'm in a privileged position um, you know you, you write things they get out you have a position people defer to you people on your side want you to say things they want you to not say things and they get really mad at you if you either, you know, say things that are critical of them. If you don't play ball according to the way they think you want to play ball, you're part of the team. You know, you're giving you're giving our enemies you're giving our enemies lines with which they're going to come back and get you. And they get really angry about that. I'd say for me that has probably been the most consistent difficulty uh, that you know that I've that I've, I've had to face. Well, I, you know, I have the same problem every week, <laughs> uh, and uh, you know, woe betide me, you know, if I turn my gaze from the Republicans to the Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's my first answer to your question, and I will confess to you that I think hard about it. Um, can I say in good conscience that I've never told my conscience in response to that? No, I cannot. But let me make a second point. Um, and this one will, will perhaps be even more uh, controversial. Uh, when the emerging orthodoxies of the present are read back into the half-forgotten realities of the past, all sorts of strange things can happen. Uh -huh. The president that I served got into a public tip last week with Black Lives Matter over the 1994 crime bill. Well, one of the things that I studied is criminal justice policy. And I can tell you that there is a robust debate about the relationship between the 1994 crime bill and the rise of incarceration, which in fact long preceded that bill. Right? The record, the record will show. It is also a matter of fact that two thirds of the Congressional Black Caucus voted in support of that bill when it came up for passage in the House of Representatives. Now, I have, I have debated whether to enter this fray on my president's side because I know what's going to happen to me if I do. But you know, but he had the guts to stand up and challenge the newly ranked orthodoxy with some of the realities of the past. I, you know, I think there are all sorts of things wrong with our criminal justice system. I've written publicly you know, in favor of steps towards diminished incarceration, to the return to ref you know, actual reform and education and training in prisons so that people have a shot at getting jobs when they get out. I've written publicly in favor of eliminating the right of employers to learn about employees you know, criminal records, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But do I hesitate to enter that fray? You bet I do. <laughs> we look forward uh, to that call. Uh, 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 I didn't quite understand your question at first, and both of your stories helped me. What I am afraid of, 
Uh, partly because I'm self-employed, so that money is, you mm -hmm. know, there, there's no check that's arriving, you know, salary check that arrives once a week. I'm afraid of succumbing, not just out of financial pressure, but out of, frankly, ego, to demands that I write for and speak for things that promote the worst, lowest kind of public discourse that you can see on the worst internet things. And I will give you a, a specific personal example, which is close to yours. Uh, two years ago, uh, I participated in a debate sponsored by the, uh, the uh, Eastern Michigan, West, Western Michigan chapter of the Center for Inquiry, which is a secular think tank. And a number of the historically religious colleges in Grand Rapids, Michigan, including Calvin College, Aquinas College, they have uh, the, the secular and the religious there really, do, they do the lion and the lamb, whichever you consider which, they do lie down with each other. And so they have been asked by the Intercollegiate Studies Association, which is a, is a, you know, a highly conservative organization, to provide a free thinker or an atheist for a general debate on religion and public policy. And their speaker was Dinesh D'Souza. Well, uh, the fee they offered, the fee was being paid by, by the conservative organization, although it was being co-sponsored. But I didn't think much about that. I thought, why not? The fee showed me what right-wing organizations have to offer people <laughs> that, uh, that the people who usually ask me to speak don't. And it, it was a very good debate in, in which she said that I was suffering from anti-religious dementia. And I said, oh, really? Is that a, is that a diagnosis in the newest, uh, in the newest uh, medical book? And it was a debate uh, which got huge numbers of views on YouTube. So a few days later, someone called me up and asked me if I would be interested in participating in a series of debates with Mr. D'Souza under the same. Well, what I had seen on my author website and comments showed me it was a really unhealthy, uncivil, often obscene discourse that resulted from all these views on YouTube. And I thought about it, I thought, well, this will get me a lot of attention for my ideas, plus the kinds of speaking fees I do not command. Uh, and it's really, everybody talks as if we all have to make moral decisions all the time. Mostly, this kind of thing doesn't come up, but I thought, on the other hand, I will be promoting the kind of garbage that I have seen in response to this. So I said, it's really one of the hardest things that I've ever done professionally. I said, you know, I really, I really don't have time in my schedule for that, which is true. <laughs> it was true, actually. Three days later, Dinesh D'Souza was caught in a hotel room with a woman, not his wife. What, he had been talking a lot also about family values as part of the reason why religion was so important in public life. And he was fired from his job at the head of some religious college headquartered in the Empire State Building. And of course, his place on the lecture circuit diminished totally. And I thought, this is the first time I have ever made a moral decision that turned out to be the right decision because I couldn't have made the wrong decision and, and said, yes, I would do it. And the lectures would have been canceled anyway. This way I had the great satisfaction <laughs> of having made what I thought was the morally right decision. But that does come up for me a lot. The whole question of is what I'm doing just promoting junk thought on the internet or I worry about it a lot. We're at, we're at our time. We're starting a little late. Let's we take one more question. You've been very patient. Thank you very much. And thank you. My name is Dave O'Brien. Thank you to the panelists that I've here this morning for, for years and years of great work. Um, I'm old enough to remember a few moments in my life when public issues or the politics of knowledge and scholarship were actually on the table. And I thank God for, for Noam Chomsky. But not often, and most academics and intellectuals I've known over the years are relatively uninterested in the politics of knowledge. Uh, 
they shrug their shoulders when there's one or another scandal in which they see that savvy political mobilization of resources to produce and distribute knowledge to serve a private interest, economic, political, or religious, takes place. That's too bad. But the idea that if you want knowledge produced, <coughs> distributed, and supported that serves the public interest rather than private interest, the common good rather than particular good, you actually have to do something to make that happen. Union of Concerned Scientists, Physicians of Social Responsibility, tiny little groups. Huh? But if you don't do anything, you're not going to get knowledge that serves the common good of the public interest. Is there a possibility that someday the practice of the intellectual life in America will include as an integral component some development of a sense of civic engagement and political responsibility? I'm going to, I'm going to once again, I'm going to defend uh, the universities. I'm sorry, I, I, I think, actually, that day in and day out, if one asks, you know, there are millions of people, students, who go to universities. We've got, there are, I think, like 4,000 colleges and universities in the United States. All over the United States, you have campuses on which people are trying their hardest to uh, 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 disseminate traditions of knowledge, educate people. And in my experience, at many universities of many different sorts, all sorts of debates are happening. All sorts of, th th there are various contests along all sorts of dimensions. The question came up, you know, was I thinking about conservative intellectuals? Yes, I was, actually. I think there are conservative intellectuals who, that's right, are talking with liberals and left liberals and socialists and anarchists. I think that there is actually more good that is going on at our universities than the universities are getting credit for. And I think that it is actually a bad thing, the vilification of the universities. And I think that people who are in university life ought to be willing, of course, to set forth forthrightly ways in which universities fall down. And yes, the universities fall down in a variety of ways. But the universities also are doing a admirable job in, in, in ways that you know, ought to be acknowledged. I ask about this from our other two. I'll pass on this. Yeah, right. Well, I can't afford to pass on this one. Uh, uh, in, <coughs> part, you know, in part because I now work at a research center, a think tank, uh, that has to go out and raise $85 million per year, 85% of its budget. Uh, it's a soft money institution. And what that means is that as funding patterns have changed, as foundations don't write checks for general support, uh, there is a temptation to look outward uh, to sources of funding uh, that may uh, give the appearance of a wrongful relationship, and in some cases, perhaps even, perhaps even the reality of it. Uh, However things may, may look at high quality private institutions, public research institutions have suffered funding cuts of 30% since the beginning of the Great Recession uh, with no prospect, I can tell you as a student of public finance, with no prospect of restoration in, in view, which means that in part they have to look to, to student loans, students have to look to student loans, uh, and that produces one sort of social problem. But in addition, public universities are increasingly drawn to relationships with the private sector, which are not all maligned by any means, but which do 
produce and generate some serious questions in the long term. All of which is to say that one of the oldest questions in the life of the mind is the relationship between that activity on the one hand and its material basis on the other. Right? Socrates refused to take money from anyone, and so he lived in he lived in dire poverty, and he, you know, and he was, as we say in, in our tribe, a schnorr. Right? He's someone who lived off his friends a lot. Fortunately, he had a lot of rich friends, so he got good dinners and things of that sort. But, uh, you know, but we should never neglect the material substrate of the production of knowledge, and never neglect the sorts of issues that that one ever raised. Well, please join me in thanking our panelists.